The U.S. bailout, as we've said, was hard fought. Yet, going from zero to a $2 trillion stimulus package in a few days is impressive. And it's a welcome change from a lot of the dysfunction that we've seen in the self-described greatest deliberative body in the world. In an interview recorded just prior to the stimulus agreement and amid accelerating coronavirus cases in the United States, our Michelle Martin sat down with two former senators who know a thing or two about the Senate and about bipartisan compromise. They are Republican Chuck Hagel and Democrat Chris Dodd. Earlier this year, they and 68 other former senators signed an open letter in the Washington Post condemning the growing partisanship in American politics. And they tell Michelle why they think Congress is failing, why the Senate is to blame, and they talk about their own innovative answer. Senator Dodd, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Michelle. Senator Hagel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, you're, you said in your letter that Congress is failing. And while in the context of the way politics is conducted now, that might seem pretty tame. Um, but in the context of the Senate, that's kind of a shot across the bow. Um, you make the point that this has been going on for a while. You know, what was the tipping point for each of you that made you feel you had to say this? Senator Dodd, you want to start? Well, it's no one single point. That would be, if it were that, then you wouldn't need necessarily to have get a letter signed by 70 former senators. I think it's been a process where we watch the role of the Senate as an institution continue to decline in its constitutional responsibilities. The founders of this republic, it wasn't act by accident that Article I of the Constitution was to declare the role of the legislative branch, <laughs> and it would reside solely in the hands of the Congress uh, between two chambers, the Senate and the House of Representatives. And watching the legislative function, the primary function, along with oversight, but legislative function, just not work. Uh, I, I, the numbers you can play with, but just in the last year alone, you get an idea. I think there are only a handful of amendments that were even debated. The number of senators who get to the floor to talk, as they normally did, about subject matters they care about, even absent of a debate about it, has declined dramatically uh, in terms of the participation mm -hmm. and the power of the executive when it comes to declarations of, of conflict. Uh, Mm -hmm. Along the way, dealing with emergencies, uh, depriving the Constitution, depriving the Congress rather, the ability to deal with the the, the appropriations mm -hmm. process, the budget process, all of those matters are just disappearing. Give an example that the public could understand. Well, let's take one. For instance, in declaring emergencies. Mm -hmm. Now, we all know what a, a real emergency is like. You can create one or pretend you have an emergency, and, and the executive branch has done this, uh, where they then declare something to be an emergency, deprive the legislative branch of fulfilling its function to decide how much we're going to allocate as resources to deal with that emergency. Getting involved in, in, in military conflicts. You now have Senator Lee, a very conservative member of the Senate from Utah, and Tim Kaine, a progressive member of the Senate from Virginia, working together to say, wait a minute, <laughs> whether it's a Democrat in the White House or a Republican in the White House, the Constitution requires that we be involved in that decision-making process. Those are two very clear examples where the Congress, particularly in the Senate in this capacity, because the role of foreign policy, uh, the founders wanted a lot of that to reside in the Senate itself, have basically withdrawn from the conversation. Senator Hagel, what about you? Do you think, is there an example you think would help the public understand what you're talking about? Well, uh, Chris alluded to it, and I think uh, a very clear example, which I think the public understands, gets, regardless of what side you're on, uh, is, is taking congressionally appropriated, directed, mandated funds, uh, which is the role of the Congress, all money bills, and, pro and producing appropriations that, that were meant for Defense Department housing, schools, medical facilities, for members of the military and their families. To take that money that's appropriated for those purposes, specifically in legislation that the President signed, and strip that money out and use that money for a political purpose and campaign promise of the president of the United States for the wall, to build a wall uh, along our southern border. And the Congress just lets him do it. You say in your piece, which again was signed by 70 former members, former members overall, um, that this predates this administration, that this has been something that's been going on for a while. It's a, sort of a drip, drip, drip. But I'd still like you to name names. I mean, why don't you start? You know, it's easy to criticize your opponents. It's a lot harder to criticize your friends. So, Senator Hagel, I'll start with you. How have Republicans contributed to the current state of affairs? 
Well, you, you, you go back years when, when I was in the Senate with, with Chris to the Bush administration. Um, we, Republicans, I'm a Republican, uh, uh, just went along with what much of the President Bush agenda was, whether it was getting into two wars, not watching what we were doing, with, which led to the financial f fiasco of 2008, where, where uh, Chris and I were both on the banking committee. Uh, those are some examples that, that we weren't paying attention to the oath of office, Republicans, that we each and every one of us take, an oath of office not to a president, not to a specific policy of a party or a party, but to what we think is right for the country. And, and once you give in to that, and when, once you allow partisanship to rule the judgment, the judgments you make as a legislator, then, then you're going to run into trouble. So that, that's one side of it, the Republican side, I'll give you an example of how I saw it coming uh, during the Bush administration, eight years of the Bush administration. Both parties are, uh, to have to take responsibility here. Leadership in the, in the Congress, leadership in the White House, it's not one side. And Senator Dodd, when, how have Democrats contributed well, well, to this? What I'm about to tell you it was somewhat controversial, but, but I'll express my own point of view on this. I, I thought we made a terrible mistake as Democrats to eliminate the filibuster on lifetime appointments to district and appellate court judges. Uh, over the history of our country, uh, we have insisted that those nominees, nominations that will go on for a lifetime, there's only check on that decision is an impeachment of a judge uh, once that nomination has been approved at the, at the president's suggestion. And I think by giving up the role that we held historically, we made it easier to nominate people who are probably uh, more polarizing in their views than that more moderate choice or competent choice. Often cite the example, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was appointed by over 90 votes, as was Justice Scalia, uh, 90 votes. Here are two very different people, very different points of view, but there was a high regard for their abilities and competency uh, and went through. Today, it becomes a brawl over that, and some of these people are going to serve for the next 30, 40 years, maybe longer. And an unde really undemocratic, you got nine justices, but nothing like what the founders intended for the Congress to play. And exactly what Chuck was talking about. It's slow, it's frustrating, it can make you angry at the pace it moves. But there was a rationale uh, for slowing down an executive that wanted to jam things through. I thought we made a terrible mistake doing that. Well, one of the examples is this, that people talk about is the current Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell's refusal to hold hearings for the Supreme Court nominee uh, put forward by President Obama, you know, and then the Democrats complain about the hundreds of bills that the House has passed that the majority leader won't schedule. So, so given an environment like that where people are just furious about this, what, you know, what should they do? I, I'm told now, Chuck and I are there, but some 200 bills have come from the House. These are bipartisan bills, which we, we hear that never happens. It does happen. And, and they've sent them over. Now, I'm not expecting that the Senate should bring up every one of the 200 bills. But when you bring up none of them at all, <laughs> uh, and you fill the agenda by jamming through a lot of judges on the district and appellate courts for terms that will go way beyond the term of office of this president or even members of this Congress, in a sense, that, that's a misallocation of the time of the legislative branch. Legislating is the primary function, and they divided it up, the founders, in two bodies. They knew what they were doing. They'd come out of an experience where that was the absence of that. Having, having people actually have a chance to elect people to make the decisions on legislating and giving up the legislative function and turning it over to the executive branch and the judicial branch were far less democratic than the legislative branch. That's one of the reasons, probably the primary reason, that we have made a suggestion, the 70 senators, Republicans and Democrats, in the letter we sent to the current members of the Senate to cons have them consider setting up a bipartisan caucus to set a new standard, a new environment, so you can deal with these kinds of things. If you don't have some forum, some process for people to develop uh, a relationship to get things done for a purpose, to move ahead of just raw partisanship, then it's, it's only going to get worse, it, and the, the body will, will only continue to abdicate 
their responsibilities. Okay, but excuse now, me, I, I, don't they have I, a mechanism for doing that now? They could change their leadership. I mean, couldn't a member of the Republican caucus put forward an alternative candidate as leader and get Democrats to support that? So why do you need a separate body to do what they already have the power to do? Well, that wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't be the same purpose. A bipartisan caucus is not to decide leadership. No. That's not what we're talking about. I understand that, That's but totally the leadership separate. makes these decisions. Well, I think, look, I think I think I'd be realistic well, about go ahead. it. And, and, and yeah. Chuck and I served together. Mm -hmm. it, it, whether there was a Democratic leader or a Republican leader, and and maybe Chuck thinks this is too strong a word to use. They were they were jealous of the prerogatives that they had as members and leaders of the United States Senate. If I ever said, I sat next to Robert C. Byrd on the floor of the Senate for 20 years. If I ever said in a conversation with him, you know, I've served under five presidents, he probably wouldn't talk to me for a week or two. Uh, because he would say, no, no, you never served under a president. You served with them. So what's, what's changed? Well, politics changed in many ways. Well, tell me more sense. about it. Well, you see, but people actually today, the money, everything's a factor. You, you can list long reasons why. But people have lost, and you wonder why the Congress today is held in lower esteem than any other institution in the country. Because it's not doing its job, the job that we expect them to do. We don't expect Congress to go along with your president of your party every day. Yeah, we understand loyalty, we understand ideology, but when you steal from the legislative branch its power to legislate, then you're violating the Constitution. And that ought to differentiate people between a loyalty based on party to a loyalty to what the Constitution expects of you. You know, you said in your letter that the 70 people who signed this letter all committed to standing with their colleagues who are currently serving if they are willing to engage in a more sort of bipartisan, sort of civil uh, process. But I, I would submit to you they could do that now. Well, they could. So why don't they? Well, I think and, sometimes, and, you know, you, you got to... I think Chuck and I, and I think certainly <laughs> Jack Danforth, Paul Kirk, and others who share the views uh, that we do, Realize, when you talk to sitting members, you could hear very much the same conversation we're having with you. It's not as if they're not unaware of what's going on. And the difficulty is that one person, they're busy, they're watching their own thing. Sometimes by offering a, a structure that allows for people to come together, <laughs> you, you find that a collective response is easier to form than it is expecting individuals to stand up and suggest some change. Uh, so we're providing... That offer. When I talked the other day to I talked to Michael Bennett of Colorado, who I have great admiration for, and, and I asked that? Michael, I said, Michael, what do you think we ought to do next? And he said, well, maybe we ought to have, let me talk to some people up here, and maybe we can have, we'll invite maybe the uh, 10 or 15 of the former members to come up who are interested to sit down and talk with us about how we might do this. I think you're going to find a very willing Senate, Democrats and Republicans, uh, to welcome an offer of a structure that would give them an opportunity to sit down without individually standing up and doing it themselves. Okay, so Senator Hagel, what about you? Senator Dodd just said that he's heard from some of his friends who are currently serving, people on his side of the aisle. And, 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 and what about you? Have you had a chance to talk to any Republican members? I mean, certainly you had, what, 19 former Republican members sign this statement, but what about those currently serving? So the Republicans are in a situation where they're the majority now. They've got a Republican president who hammers on them every day, threatens them every day. If you vote against me on any issue or speak out against me, uh, I'll go after you in a primary. So they're threatened. I get that. I mean, I've been there. Chris has been there. Sure, uh, that's that's tough. But you got to you got to rise above that. And and uh, I, I think if 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 you had a, had some Republicans who were agreeing with that, and I think a lot of them do, but may just be in these tough situations where they're afraid to do it. But uh, strength in numbers helps. Getting along with people help. And I sh think showing your constituents that you can co-sponsor a bill with a Democrat and actually work with a Democrat. They're not the enemy. They're not the devil. They're not evil. And get something done. I, I think that's the way you start to change it. Forgive me, Senator, you know, with, with great respect for all of your service in so many areas. You're talking about a situation where you just mentioned, you know, the president beats on peoples and primaries peoples. You know, you've got tens of millions of dollars being raised to attack people, some of it directed by groups that we know, some of it directed by groups that we don't know. Um, you've got a president who's willing to campaign for people's primary opponents if he finds that they're not sufficiently supportive of him. Um, you've got, you know, outside groups who are willing to pour millions of dollars into really small races just to make the point that they are not to be defied. So in the face of all of that, is a bipartisan caucus where people get together and, 
you know, know each other as human beings. Is that really enough? Well, Chris and I have both said it. Uh, that alone is not going to change it. Here, one thing, to really answer your question, why do you want to be a United States senator? Why do you want to be a United States senator? Do you want to be a United States senator to make the, uh, the world better and to follow uh, your judgments, listening to people? You must have some thoughts about things before you would run or want to accomplish some things. And, and how you want to do it is important, too. I mean, how you're going to be remi remembered in history by your family, by your colleagues, all those things are on the minds of elected officials. Yep. And I think anybody who runs for the Senate, Democrat, Republican, uh, is proud uh, of their service. They're proud of what they're trying to do for the country. And let's bring, uh, bring a little of that back in focus, yeah. rather than just cowering and say, oh, my gosh, oh, I have to do whatever the party tells me, the president tells me, oh, I want to keep my job so bad. Hell, when I was in the Senate, Secretary of Defense, any job I had, I said, I don't need to be a senator. I don't need to be Secretary of Defense. I had a, I had a good life before, before any of those jobs. But if I'm going to do it, I'm going to listen and try to be informed, try to be honest, tell the people what I believe and why I'm going to vote the way I am, but do what I think is the right thing in the interest of this country. I know that's tough as hell. I know that's difficult. But we, we've got to find some courage again. It's yeah. in, not that I was setting myself up yeah. that I'm the model. I was just one of many yeah. who, who tried to do that. You Senator know, it, it, it needs to be repeated over and over again. There are great people serving in the Senate today. <laughs> this is a very difficult time. A lot of institutions have suffered recently. A lot of changes are occurring. Certainly social media, the Internet changes. The business you're in, Michelle. Yeah, the death everything. of local oh, news, right. where people don't necessarily know that I have no doubt. Well. I have no doubt that individual members of the Senate understand this, care about it. There are only been about 2,000 people who have ever served in the United States Senate in 240 years. There are only about 150 of us that are still alive that served in the Senate. O over half, around half of those people, within 72 hours, signed a letter saying, we'd like to see the institution get back on its feet again. And you're absolutely right. Is this going to change the world? But maybe, what else could we do other than, can't we do something and let people know? We love serving in that body. We care about it very much. We felt the responsibility of being there as the United States Senator. And we believe very strongly that those views are not exclusive to us. I believe that the members who are serving today, the two that followed Joe Lieberman and I in the Senate, Dick Blumenthal and Chris Murphy, are doing a great job. Todd Young from Indiana, young senator from Oklahoma, the Republican, I think has got some cares about these kind of issues. So I'm far more optimistic. Chuck said something earlier that really needs to be reinforced, Dem how democracies die. They don't die by coup d'etats any longer. You destroy people's confidence in institutions. You just erode them, constantly undermine them all the time. And good and decent people can succumb when they're angry and they're fearful and they're worried about their future. Demagogues come along and they take advantage of that. We want to offer an alternative to that idea. Chuck Hagel, former senator from Nebraska, also former secretary of defense. Thank you. Chris Dodd, former senator from Connecticut. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank today. you, Michelle, very much. Thank you. Thank you both.